Hello and thank you for watching my video. My name is Astrid Krasnici. Uh, this is going to be part two of uh, chapter uh, five, CCNA semester three. Okay, we just finished configuring uh, basic single area OSPF. Now we're going to move on to OSPF network types. So OSPF will have five different network types. First one is point to point. Then we have a broadcast multi-access, non-broadcast multi-access, point to multipoint and virtual links. Now we can explain one by one. So point to point network for example two routers interconnected over the common link that is called a point to point. No other routers are on the link this is often the configuration of wide area network links so that is point to point. Broadcast multiple routers interconnected over Ethernet network. For example, you have here with a switch in the middle, that's called multi-access. Broadcast multi-access. So if we send the broadcast message or multicast message, everybody's going to get it. And then on the top there, you can see that's a point-to-point. -point. So this network here is a broadcast multi-access. On this network, you don't have to elect the DR or BDR because it's point-to-point. -point. On this network, we have to elect one DR and one VDR because it's a broadcast multi-access. I'm going to show you a bit later why we have to do that. Multiple uh, non-broadcast multi-access is like for example when you use it in frame relay. So multiple routers interconnected in network that does not allow broadcast like frame relay. So that's called we only uh, allow to send a unicast messages so, uh, and that's called non-broadcast multi-access. In this scenario, router 1, 2 and 3 are in interconnected over frame relay network. Frame relay does not allow broadcast. OSPF must be configured accordingly to create neighbors adjacencies. Point and multipoint, multiple routers interconnected in a hub and a spoke topology over non-broadcast multi-access network. Often used in a connect to connect the branch sites with a central site or hub and spokes. So connect the spokes with the hub. And then we have a virtual links, special OSPF type network type, used to interconnect distant OSPF areas to the backbone area. For example, we told you the area, every area has to be connected directly to area 0. And in this case, we have area 0 on the left and we have a area 51 on the right. So area 0 is directly, area 1 is directly connected to area 0. But area 51 is not directly connected to area 0. This is not allowed in OSPF. If for some reason you have this type of network, you have one network that will enable this. This is like a, a temporary, so you don't have, it's not permanent solution. In this scenario, area 51 cannot connect directly to area 0. A special OSPF area must be configured to connect area 51 to area 0. The R1, R1 and R2 area, one must be configured as a virtual link. So these two routers, we connect them as a virtual link. And now, virtually, we connect area 51 to area 0. Multi-access networks can create two challenges for OSPF regarding the flooding of LSA. Now, LSA is link state advertisement. As soon as there's a link change, then we're going to send an LSA. Once we get the LSA, we're going to forward that LSA to all of our neighbors. Now, creation of multiple adjacencies Ethernet networks could potentially interconnect with many OSPF routers over a common link and creating adjacencies with every router is unnecessary and undesirable. This would re lead to an excessive number of LSA exchange between routers on the same network. Extensive flooding of LSAs, link state routes flood their link state packets when OSPF is initialized or when there is a change in the topology. This flooding can become excessive. The following formula can be used to calculate the number of required adjacencies. So n times n minus 1 divided by 2. So in figure, we have four routers. Four, four routers, they're going to have adjacency with... Uh, so each router is going to have an adjacency with one router, uh, neighboring router. So 4 times 3 divided by 2. 4 times 3 is 12. Divided by 2 is 6. Flooding of LSA. I want you to imagine, I've got a router 1. It's connected to a switch and it's connected the switch is connected to router 2, 3, 4 and 5. This is what's going to happen in OSPF if we have adjacency with everybody. 
So imagine Rudy wants got a new link. Once he has a new link, he will create an LSA and it's going to send it to his neighbors. That LSA is inside the LSU and it will be forwarded to all his neighbors. 224.005. Now all the neighbors are going to get it. First thing, before they even run the algorithm, first thing that they're going to do is replicate this LSA and try to send it to their neighbors. So let's have a look now at what is going to happen. Router 3 down here is going to create an LSA, right? Same time, all other routers are doing the same thing, yeah? It's going to create an LSA, it's going to send it, trying to notify the neighbors. Now other routers will create an LSA and will do the same thing. So as you can see, we have one LSA and we have created a lot of LSA flooding of these LSAs. For this reason, it's better if we elect a DR, designated router. Now this designated router and backup designated router is in case if designated router fails, they will listen to different address. They will listen to 224006. So instead of sending our LSAs to everybody, we're going to send it to designated router and it's the job of designated router to forward that LSA to other routers. So to elect the designated router, we have to look at the priority. The, prior, the highest priority will win. So if they have a, all equal the priority, priority one, router one has one, two, they all have one, and router five has a priority of zero. If they have priority of zero, it means that they will not take part on any election. So if its priority is the same, then we look at the next thing we need to look at is router ID. They have to check the router ID, the highest one will win. Since the router 5 has priority 0, we're not even checking his router ID. So now, if you look at the router ID, the highest router ID is router 4. So router 4 will win the election. So the router 4 is the DR, designated router, and it will listen to a special address made just for the DR, 224006. In case the router 4 fails, then we have to elect a backup designated router. Again, we look at the priority, it's the same, then we look at the router ID. The next router ID on the highest is router 3, so router 3 will win. If, if I will be the DR, if the current backup, uh, the current DR will fail. So now we have elected the DR, router 4, and BDR, router 3. Router 5 didn't want to take part in the election. When there's a new link, the router 1 will send an LSA, but now the LSA will not be 224.005 to all OSPF routers it will be to 224006, which means only the DR. Sends it to the DR, so both DR and BDR are going to listen to that address, but it's the job of the DR to forward that LSA to all the routers, 224005, right? Like that. Now, router 1, for example, and router 2, they do not need to be full adjacency because they're never going to speak to each other. They need to have a full adjacency only with the DR and only with the BDR, not with each other. So router 1, 2 and 3 will be stuck to two-way. So DR and BDR election. So default OSPF interface priority is 1. Let me just increase this full screen. So DR priority is 1. The following criteria is applied. The DR, router with the highest OSPF interface priority will win. BDR, BDR, router with the second highest OSPF interface priority. If the priority is the same, if OSPF interface priority are equal, then highest router ID is used to break up the tie. Verifying BDR, DR and BDR roles, show IP OSPF, interface, gigabit, ethernet 00, and then that's our interfaces. So we can see that the process ID we use in 10, router ID is 111, Network type is a broadcast, cost 1, we didn't adjust the reference bandwidth there, even though it's gigabit, it says cost 1, uh, state DR other, if you mean DR other, it means that it's not even, it's not a DR or BDR, the priority is 1. The designated router, it says it's 333, which is this one, and backup designated router is 2222, this one, router 2. So neighbor count is 2, adjacent, adjacent with the, both neighbors, with the DR and BDR. If we do it on the router 2, for example, it will say the priority, so it wasn't the priority that decided this, it was the router ID. 
So designated router is the highest router ID, which is router 3. And backup designated router is us, which is, is this one is router 2. 2, 2, 2, 2, state, BDR. If we do the same on the router 3, we can see the router 3 is the DR. So state, it says a DR. And priority is the 1 again, and then the router ID is the highest router ID. That's why 1. If I do show IP OSPF neighbor, I can see that I have a full relationship with the BDR and a full adjacency with the DR as well. So if I do show IP OSPF neighbor on the router 2 and router 3, you can see the router 2 has a relationship with the DR other. The router 1 is DR other. If router 1 had another neighbor, say router 4 for example, here it would say two way. Timing of DR and BDR election. If I boot first and start the election before the other were ready, I would be the DR. So now, with the DR and BDR election, it's pretty much the timing is important. If you enable the OSPF and the OSPF, one of the routers boots up first, then it's going to be a DR. It doesn't matter even if it has a small priority or low priority. The problem is that with OSPF, it's not preempt. So once the election is done, that's it. Until the DR fails, nothing is going to happen. So the DR and BDR election process takes place as soon as the first router with the OSPF enabled interface is active on a multi-access network. This could be a lower end router that took less time to boot, which might not be the best router to handle the functions of the DR. The OSPF DR and BDR election decision is based on the following criteria in sequential order. The router in the network elects the router with the highest interface priority as a DR. Router with the second highest will become the BDR. So the priority is more important here now. The priority can be any number from 0 to 255. 0 being not taking part in the election at all. 255 is the highest. The higher the priority, the likelier the router will be selected as a DR. If the priority is set to 0, the router is not capable of becoming the DR. The default priority is 1. Therefore, unless otherwise configured, all routers have the equal priority and must rely on another tie to break the met uh, method using the DR and BDR election. The second method is a router ID. Router with the highest router ID will become the DR and the second highest will become the BDR. In IPv6 network, if there are no IPv4 address configured on the router, then the router ID must be manually configured with the router ID command. Or OSPF version 3 will not start. Serial interfaces have default priority set to 0, therefore they do not elect a DR and BDR. The DR becomes the focal point for the collection of the and distribution of LSA, therefore this router must have sufficient CPU and memory capacity to handle the workload. Instead of relying on the router ID, it is better to control the election by setting interface priorities. Priorities are the interface specific value which means that it provides better control on a multi-access network. To set the priority on the interface, use the following command, IP OSPF priority and then the value for version 2 and version 3 will be IPv6 OSPF priority and then the value. Again, 0 to 0 does not become the DR. 1 to 255, the higher, better. The changes do not automatically take effect because the DR and BDR are already elected. Therefore, OSPF election must be negotiated using one of the following methods. We can shut down the router interface and then re-enable it, or reset the OSPF by using clear IP OSPF process. The best method will be instead of shutting down, or instead of clearing the whole process, because you might have other neighbors, shut down the interfaces. G00, shut down, no shut. G00 again here, shut, no shut, and then 00 here, shut, then no shut. And then we will see the correct DR and BDR. So you have to go to the interface and then IP interface gigabit 00, IP OSPF priority 255. We'll do that. So now if we shut down, no shut down, we make sure that router 1 will be our DR, router 2 will be the BDR and router 3 does not take part in the election. Propagating a default static route in OSPF version 2. With OSPF, the router connected to the internet is used to propagate a default route to other routers in the OSPF routing domain. The router is sometimes called the edge or the entrance or the gateway router. However, in OSPF terminology, 
the router located between OSPF routing domain and non-OSPF routing uh, network is also called Autonomous System Boundary Router or ASBR. In figure, R2 is se selected uh, single home, which has got connection to one service provider. Therefore, all it's required for R2 to reach the internet is default static route to the service provider. To propagate the default route, the edge router, router 2, must be configured with a default static route, IP route, the command IP route, then four zeros, quad zeros, space, another quad zeros, then the either exit interface or the neighbor's IP address. Then to propagate this default static route, we go to the OSPF1 and say default information originate. So default hyphen information originate. For as long as we have the static route, the default route will be propagated. Sometimes if you don't have the static route, but you still want to propagate a default route, you'd have to type here, there's another word, always. That doesn't matter if you have a static route or not, it will be propagated. With this command only, default information originate, you have to have a static route for the information to be propagated. If the default information originate command is not used, the default quad zero route will not be propagated to other routers in OSPF area. Verify the default route setting on R2 using the show IP route. Now once we verify that, we will see the O2, then an asterisk, and then E2. Okay, here we don't see it, because here is uh, itself. Router 2 has got a static route, default static route that is going towards the uh, neighbor's IP address. Once that propagates, when we send that router to other routers, so that route, a default route to other router 1 and router 3, for example, and when we say show IP route, we can see that one route has been, we learn one route through OSPF, and it's got a star here, E2 which means it's external to and it's uh, potential to be the, the default route. So quad zeros forward slash zero via the network if router two. So gateway of last resort is 172.16.3.2 for every network. So any network that we want to send the packets to, we're going to send it to 3.2 which is the IP address of router two. The process of propagating default static route in OSPF version 3 is almost identical to route version 2. The propagate default route, the edge router must be configured with a static route first and then propagate that route. So on IPv6, a default route is IPv6 route, colon colon forward slash zero and then neighbor's IP address. Then we go to the process and we say default information originate. To verify it, show IP route, we can see it that we have a static route for router 2 and router 1 for example will have a learned route, external route, E2 as a static, as a default route. OSPF hello and dead intervals. The OSPF hello and dead intervals are configurable on per interface basis. OSPF hello and dead intervals are very important because they have to match for to have a neighbor adjacency. So the OSPF interval must match or a neighbor adjacency will not occur. To verify the configured uh, intervals, interval, uh, interface intervals, you, should, you say show IP OSPF interface command. For example, show IP OSPF interval, interface serial 00. We can see that hello is set to 10 and dead is set to 40. Modifying, you just have to go, if you want to change the timers, you have to go to the interface and say IP OSPF hello interval whatever seconds you want to do and the dead interval whatever seconds you want to do. Now it's important that you remember that this interval has to uh, match. Okay maybe we want to check that just uh, say uh, go to the interface we have this already configured so Cisco enable us show IP OSPF interface S000. We can see that the hellos are sent every 10 seconds and dead is sent every 40 seconds. So if I want to change it for example, I go config T interface S000 IP OSPF hello maybe I send it every I don't know, 5 seconds and IP OSPF dead interval dead interval so 20 seconds. So if I do show IP OSPF neighbor, 
see this one is gonna underneath 30 so it's gonna go down so as soon as it goes down to zero so it shouldn't never go underneath 30 so every 10 seconds you're getting a hello message so we will lose adjacency with router 2 because we change this uh, interval so interface s000 is towards router 2 so that's it we're not getting hello messages anymore soon we're gonna lose our adjacency and that's it done okay so OSPF automatically will adjust dead timers to four times the hello timer to restore it we have to go uh, IP OSPF hello interval five uh, make sure that we configure on the other side as well then we will have adjacency so on the link this link here is per interface yeah so if you said five seconds hello five seconds on this side has to be hello so let's do that maybe let's go to router 2 and reset that so go to router 2 uh, Cisco class um, show IP OSPF interface S000 you see here we send it every 10 seconds and 40 seconds so if you want to change it you go to interface S000 IP OSPF hello we said 5 yeah and now we should have a neighbors and that's it right away we got a neighbor the router one so as long as they match we have neighbors version 3 is, uh, is very similar uh, like OSPF version 2 OSPF version 3 intervals can be also adjusted version 3 hello and dead intervals can be modified manually using the following interface commands IP v6 OSPF hello intervals and then seconds Sa same as version 3 uh, sorry version 2 use the no IPv6 OSPF hello intervals and no IPv6 OSPF dead intervals command to reset to the default now we have to remember the, our routers, our targets so the role of router in the network is, not, is so crucial that are often the targets of network attacks network administrator must be aware that routers are at risk from attack just mu as much as the end user system in general, routing system can be attacked by disrupting the routing pattern appears or by falsifying the information carried within the routing protocol. Falsified routing information might generally be used to cause system to misinform, lie to each other, cause denial of service, DOS attack, or cause traffic to flow a path it would not normally flow. So for example, it will go to attacker. The consequences of falsifying routing information are redirecting traffic to create a routing loops, redirecting traffic so it can be monitored on an insecure link, and redirecting traffic to discard it. Securing routing updates when a router neighboring authentication has been configured on a router, the router authenticates the source of each routing update packet that it receives. This is accomplished by exchange of authenticated keys, sometimes referred to as a password, that is known on both sending and receiving router. To exchange routing updates, information is a secure manner enable authentic OSPF authentication. OSPF authentication can either be none, no authentication, simple, clear text authentication, or message digest 5 authentication, or MD5. OSPF version 3 supports, uh, OSPF supports three types of authentication. Like we said, null, no authentication, simple password authentication, this is also referred to as plain text, and MD5, which is encrypted format. OSPF version 3, OSPF for IPv6, does not include any authentication capabilities of its own. Instead, it will re rely entirely on IPv6, uh, sorry, IPsec to secure communication between neighboring using the IPv6 OSPF authentication IPsec SPI interface configuration. Configuring OSPF MD5 authentication, for example, first we need to assign a key, assign the key ID and the key to be used to the neighboring router that are used to OSPF MD5 authentication. IP, this is by interface, yeah? So you go to the interface, you say IP OSPF message digest key, key ID, and then MD5 the password. The key ID can be anything from 1 to 255, but must match on each router to authenticate. MD5 says encryption and the password is encrypted password do not have to be the same throughout the, the, an area but they must be same between the neighbors 
maximum 16 characters. Specify the authentication type using the inter interface configuration command on the interface or globally. So we can say IP OSPF authentication message digest. And then we say area, area, whatever, zero, authentication, message digest. So we can either do it per interface. So if, for example, we want, to inter we want to authenticate just two routers or we want to inter uh, authenticate the whole area. Enabling MD5 authentication globally on R1, for example, router OSPF, the whole area will be authenticated using a message digest. And then you go per each interface, you create the key. IP OSPF message digest key 1, MD5, Cisco 123. And then we go to the other interface, we create the same key. And the third interface, we create the same key again. Enabling MD5 authentication only on the interface, so IP OSPF authentication message digest only for the inter inside the interface. Verifying the authentication, show IP OSPF interface and then whatever interface is in question. And right here at the end, you see that message digest authentication is enabled and we are using key ID 1.